Yeah, Yahweh, I know you are faithful to the end. Yeah. When darkness hovers over me, when I can't see a light, when mountains seem insurmountable, and I can't see the fight, when I have tried everything, exhausted all my might, and life just hits me hard, and there's no end in sight. God, I'm reminded of your faithfulness. And how you promise we'll walk together through all of this Though I'm suffering now, it's only temporary Your powerful name crippled our adversary So I will rest in the promises you've given me In his name I will live for all eternity In the presence of the Father of kindness I'm covered by his blood, yeah I'm counted as righteous Just a few words from his mouth and he got time going His glory covers the earth, inventing gravity Majestic mountains to mount before his majesty Magically he hung up the stars like they were tapestry Wonderfully he drew up the world and all the galaxies Happily created the earth and did it tactfully Craftfully created mankind and our ancestry And he made the colors, just take that in Measured the length of the heavens with the breath of his hand What's even more, he made you Knows every hair on your head, yes, he has named you. You're worth the death of his son, yes, he has saved you. Oh, he has saved you, and he has claimed you. And all of this, because of love, go ahead and call on his name. He is the Lord. You've been my God, my Lord, do it all. You've been faithful, Father, do it all. When I fall, I am certain you'll answer me right when I call. You're not a genie that grants me my every want and need. You are the God who faithfully takes away my greed and lust and pride. Then plants a seed and helps me grow as a man of God to serve and lead. It's more important to know the healer than being healed. I feel in love with your being, not the power you give. So when I'm backed in the corner, I call the cornerstone. And boldly come to the king who's seated on the throne. I live to worship the king and make his name known. He is the God who will never, ever leave you alone. You've been my God, my Lord, do it all. You've been faithful, Father, do it all. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for Seeds with Wellington Heights Community Church. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're really glad that you're with us this morning. Now, Seeds is our virtual shortened Sunday experience, and right now we're digging into the eight key components of Christian community development. Wellington Heights Community Church is part of CCDA, which is the Christian Community Development Association, and Kian and I also lead up the local network of CCDA right here in Eastern Iowa. Before we get into worship this morning, we have a few announcements that we wanted to share with you. Now, I can't believe we've already gotten snow in October this year. And the 2020 has just brought a lot of unique challenges upon all of us. And we're really glad to be partnering with McKinley Steam Academy to help stock the McKinley Clothes Closet with new or gently use winter gear. So hats, coats, gloves, scarves, those kinds of things. Now here are some ways that you can contribute to this. You can drop off new or gently used items at McKinley, Monday through Friday, 
7 a.m. to noon. And you can do this for the next couple weeks until November 13th. Now to drop off a face covering is required. Now, if you're limited on time, that's okay. Let us do the shopping for you. You can donate online or send a check or cash to us at Wellington Heights Community Church, PO Box 462, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and indicate that this is for shopping for McKinley Winter Gear. And we will shop for you and we'll deliver the items to McKinley. Now this month, um, we are inviting um, those who call Wellington Heights Community Church their home to consider making a financial pledge or commitment for 2021 towards supporting the ministry. Now, whether that be a consistent tithe, making a one-time gift, or giving as you're able, your pledge is simply an estimate of your planned giving for 2021. And this is going to be really helpful for us in planning and budgeting for the upcoming ministry year. We have an online pledge form that's going to be provided in the comments below. And if you'd like to receive a physical pledge letter in the mail, just email us at wellingtonheightschurch at gmail.com and we'll get one in the mail for you. Now, we um, are just really thankful for the generosity and we recognize that your financial support is what fuels and sustains the ministry of Wellington Heights Community Church. We're thankful, we're grateful, and we recognize that we need one another and we're better together. Now, this Sunday is a particularly unique one in the church calendar. It's All Saints Day. All Saints Day is an opportunity to remember and give thanks for all those who have gone before us in the faith. From the early days of Christianity, there is a sense that the church not only consists of living believers, but all those who have gone before us. In Hebrews 12, we see and read that the author is encouraging us to remember that there's a great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. On All Saints Day, we remember those who are part of this great cloud of witnesses. We remember and we tell stories of those who have gone to glory. Alongside the likes of Paul from the New Testament, we remember and tell stories maybe of the grandma who took us to church every Sunday, or we remember the pastor who was with us and prayed with us in the hospital, or the neighbor who opened their home for us, who listened to us or shared with us in our times of need. So on All Saints Day, let us give thanks for both the saints and glory and those on earth who have demonstrated in both word and deed the hope that's found in Jesus. As they have shared the gospel with us with their lives, may we also be compelled to go and do likewise so that someone else may know about the grace and the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We also recognize that this particular year has been incredibly and uniquely difficult for losing a loved one for the grief process. We no longer have those practices and rituals that provide comfort during times of intense sorrow and loss. We recognize this and as a faith community, we are covering you in prayer. We're with you. And right now we want to take a moment to silently remember and honor the legacy of those who have gone before us with a special mindfulness to those you have known who have passed away this year. In our church family, we specifically honor and remember Harper Leah Walters. And God, we thank you that she demonstrated your love and grace and joy with her life and how it continues in her legacy of love. And we wanted to spend some time together before we enter into worship. So let us pray together. God, we recognize that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We thank you for their example. We praise you for their lives of faith. We thank you for loved ones who are now resting in you, who guided us, nurtured us, cared for us, and whom we love deeply. We thank you for our ancestors who worked and lived and died so that we might be who we are, where we are. And we remember that therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, that we may lay aside every weight of sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Amen. All right.
this song is for you young people out there. It's for you old too. You know, if you're still drinking milk, this is for you. But if you're not drinking any milk, you already should know, you know. Come on, it keeps on. Keeps on making a way for us, no matter what we go through. No matter what the Justice Department do, the milk department, the bakery, no matter what anybody does, God keeps making a way. It may not seem today that everything's okay. I thought that when I was a teenager too, but let me tell you something. I'm still here today to tell you He's done so much for all of us, and He will continue. But you gotta obey. You gotta do the best you can for the best knowledge you have. Stay in church, stay with your pastor, learn the words of them, and then put on the armor of God. Romans 8. That's what you wear armor for. It's a spiritual warfare. <laughs> God, it is you who have made us. We belong to you. You created every detail of our beings. We belong to you. You are unimaginable in every way. Our best guesses about you don't come close to your glory. We belong to you. You have blessed us immensely with your presence, with love, with Christ and the Spirit. We belong to you. You have made us one with you in Christ. 
we belong to you. We often go around thinking that we are separate from you, separate from each other. But the truth is that we are all made of the same dust, parts of the same whole. God, grant that we may know the vastness of your love, the depths of our belonging, and grant that we may live in unity with one another and with you. May we live each day resting in this welcoming truth. We belong to you. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 4 through 8 and 12 through 15. Got up from supper, took off his garments, and taking a servant's towel, he fastened it around his waist. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the servant's towel with which he was girded. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are my feet to be washed by you? Is it for you to wash my feet? Jesus said to him, You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later on. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you have no part within me. You have no share in companionship with me. Verse 12. So when he had finished washing their feet and had put on his garments and had sat back down, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me the teacher, master, and the Lord, and you are right in doing so, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, master, have washed your feet, you ought. It is your duty. You are under obligation. You owe it to wash one another's feet. For I have given you this as an example so that you should do in your turn what I have done to you. A reading from the book of Matthew. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people. Good morning. I'm really glad that you're joining us this morning. We look forward to one day seeing your face, but for right now to keep each other safe, I'm glad that we get to spend time together in this way on Sunday mornings. Now, who knows what the very first book of the Bible is called? I'll give you a hint. It's in this book that we learn about the story of Adam and Eve. Now shout it out at home if you know the answer. Now, if you said Genesis, you are right. In the beginning of the Bible, there's a book called Genesis. And in Genesis, we get to learn about the creation story where God created everything in the world. He created all things unique and with a special purpose. Now, today we're going to talk about how God has made each of us in a special and unique way. Now, I love seeing how God has made each one of you uniquely. And right now I'm thinking of you and I see how God has given us each different qualities and talents that make us unique. Whether it's a love of math and science, to learning about space, to liking to build Legos. And I know we have a lot of people who are really good friends that are eager to share and listen and be kind. 
And I also know we have some really talented musicians and athletes who love basketball, soccer, or baseball. Now God has made each one of you unique so that we can share his love through what we enjoy doing and what we're good at. Now let's take one minute to share with whoever you're watching with right now how you think God has made the other person unique and special. Now let's take time to share how we can see one another using what has God has given us to be unique to help others. Now, one thing I really enjoy doing is baking. And I love baking and sharing with my neighbors and people I know to help them feel God's love. And you also get to use what you enjoy doing or what you're good at to help others around you feel special and loved. Doesn't matter if you're four or 44 or 104. God has given us each an ability to help those around us and make the world a better place. Now today is a special day in the church calendar called All Saints Day. This is a day when we get to remember all the people in our lives who have helped us know God more or helped us made, made us feel God's love. Now on this day, I remember my grandpa who was already was always ready to help me or anyone who he knew. He was generous with his time, with the things he was good at, and also with his money. And he was always willing to help someone out. Now, I'd love for you to think about the person in your life who has helped you know God more and experience God's love. Now, after you've thought about that person, why don't you share with someone that you're watching with? And now, let's pray together. God, thank you for making us in your image. We thank you that you have made us each special and unique. Help us to be able to see how you have made all of us special and unique and able to make a difference in the world and to share your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So I grew up in an under-resourced community. Uh, there was gun violence, drugs, and gangs, and, and the schools that were around my area were not as resourced as schools in other areas. Uh, the housing value was was low, and the, the racial inequality was high. And this happened uh, for generations before us. And growing up where I did, again, the racial disparity was high, the inequality was high, and the philosophy uh, of, of, of neighborhoods like mine was if you get a chance to leave, uh, never come back. In fact, everybody believed this about our neighborhood, right? Um, where we lived was hell and everywhere else was heaven. Uh, there, was, there was no hope for change. There was no community pride. No one looked at our community and said, man, I, I can't wait to, to live there. It's my dream to live there. Those who lived in the community thought it was forsaken. And those who heard about our community, they, they thought it was forsaken. Again, the philosophy was, if you want to be successful, leave this area, live in a suburb, live somewhere else in the city or, or another city altogether. And we've seen this played out. Anybody who, who was successful, they left. Um, and they never came back. And if, in fact, if they did come back, it was just to kind of show us that, hey, you can make it out too. Uh, you just need to get like me. See, with this dream, under-resourced communities continue to lose their greatest resources, namely their indigenous leaders. Imagine with me for a second. So uh, imagine youth from under-resourced communities. Imagine if they were trained to disciple, developed a trade or, or went to college and became doctors and lawyers and, and law enforcement um, officers and plumbers and pastors and community develop, uh, developers. And, and they chose to come back and, and, and to the places where they grew up and, and, and or any other under-resourced community and train up the next generation. Wouldn't that be amazing? See, see at, at Wellington Heights Community Church, uh, we call this indigenous leadership development. That is 
Not only is it important to establish leadership development, but also invest in developing the mo in the most vulnerable places and, and have those people come back and invest in the places that are deemed undesirable. Oftentimes, uh, we look at under-resourced communities and we echo what Nathaniel said in the Gospel of John. What good could come from Nazareth, that, that God-forsaken place? At Wellington Heights Community Church, we believe that there are no God-forsaken places, but there are only church-forsaken places. That is, places where the church has failed to invest in for whatever reason. Uh, many, many say it's not their calling or claim that there are no leaders there. Some, some have actually tried and, 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 and maybe failed it for whatever reason. Ultimately, deeming these places as condemned or hopeless or, or God forsaken. But I want to reinforce that God is in under-resourced communities. There are leaders that have been hard at work for years. Many times these leaders are waiting for the rest of the body to stop making excuses and show up for the long haul. It's a lie to think that God is not in, in places like under-resourced areas. If you want to uh, read more about this, honestly, it's in Matthew 25. Uh, so we are committed to a leadership development right here at Wellington Heights. So what is a leader? I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to talk about leadership because there, this world is filled with uh, so many books and sermons and speakers that touch on this topic. There's a lot of noise uh, around this, this topic of what makes a leader. But one piece that, in my opinion, that, that I think we, uh, we miss out on is the, the leadership that Jesus displayed and specifically his humility in his leadership. See, in churches, uh, leadership is displayed as this macho man position. A, a leader is someone who knows all the right things and, and, and takes a stance and, and doesn't doubt. Uh, this person is almost always male uh, and, and knows uh, the Bible back and forth, uh, someone who is dominant. However, that is not uh, the leadership that Jesus displays. And it's not actually the type of person that Jesus uh, uh, selects to be on his, his team. In fact, when John and James asked uh, to be on Jesus' right and, and left side in heaven, Jesus responded in Matthew 20 like this. You know, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servants. And whoever wants to be first must, must become a slave. Jesus displayed this throughout his life. He, he creates uh, this memorable moment with, with the disciples in the Gospel of John uh, before he's condemned to the cross. It says, so Jesus got up from his meal. He took off his outer clothing. He wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured uh, into a basin water and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm, I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. When he had finished washing their feet, he put, the, uh, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done? He asked him. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also washed another, uh, one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done. See, these verses are not the common verses that people use when preaching and teaching about leadership. See, Jesus' form of leadership is one of servanthood, someone who would who is willing to withdraw and sacrifice his or her life for the good of others. Someone willing to, to be the shoulders that others stand on. Someone who is willing to decrease that others may, may increase. And so before we start developing leaders, we need to hammer down words like, like these words from Dr. John Perkins. He says, godly leadership is not about obtaining recognition or glory. It's about serving others. The big deal is we think the power is in, in us individually, but the power is in us collectively. Godly leadership sees the potential in all people. Godly leadership takes the low-class, unlearned fisherman to be the rock of the church. He doesn't say, no, Peter, you're not ready yet. 
He says, you will be the rock of the church. Pastors, how many fishermen and fisherwomen have you passed up for people who seem like they're ready? People with theology degrees and seem like they have it all together. See, godly leadership tells the woman at the well her worth. Godly leadership gives authority to women who were seen as lower class to be the first to preach the gospel to his remaining 11 disciples. Leadership must start with humility and servanthood. So, so now that we know the type of leader we should be, how do we move forward with leadership development? I believe that it starts with the gift that Jesus gives all of his disciples and really everybody on his ministry team. He gives them a gift of affirming their dignity. See, we don't have the gift uh, or the power to give people uh, dignity, but we do have the power to affirm it. We as the people of God must begin to see all people as made uh, with uh, as made in the image of God with dignity and worth and gifts and value because Although we're all sinners, we are made in the image of God. And God cherished us so much that he gave his only son for us. If we're not approaching leadership development on those terms, we are prone to judge others based on our expectations. And really, we just start to form people in the image of us, not God or not not, uh, what God has made them to be. We must have the best interests of those who we're developing in mind. We must be willing to give of ourselves that they may increase. We must invest in leaders with sound doctrine, but also holistic development. That means in every part of their being, physically, psychologically, economically, and et cetera. Uh, Leaders love the whole person. uh, And many are ill-equipped to disciple in this way, especially in under-resourced communities, because they lack the, the cultural experience, the historical narrative, the knowledge to even attempt. So people will uh, build a theology that, that gives an excuse for why they're not called to those areas or those types of people. Uh, you know, and so leaders, we, we can't um, just limit our leadership development um, at a person-to-person transformation. Jesus and his apostles uh, approached it or, with reconstructing and restructuring systems as well, because sinful systems are created by sinful people and can be torn down by redeemed people. So, so we don't want to just develop a leader and only focus on transforma- uh, personal transformation. We want to focus also on systematic transformation. And we see this in Zacchaeus, right? Here's a man who, who was forgiven of his deeds, uh, but, uh, but his, de- his repentance didn't consists of him just saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be a good person in the future. No, he looked back and he, he, he tried to right all the wrongs that he did. He recognized the systems that he created and was a part of actually hurt people. Uh, and, and, and he wanted to make those right. Thus, what he was doing was loving his neighbor as himself. See, God's not just interested in, in the system of sin being torn down in your personal life. He's also interested in and the system of sin being torn down in organizations that ultimately harm people. To this, we often hear, well, the world will always have sin and Jesus is gonna come back to fix it. Those who say that and have that kind of uh, ideology have thrown the towel and counted the cost. They decided that the cost is too high. You know, a, a doctor doesn't look at a patient and, and, and with cancer and say, you know, the world's going to always have cancer and we shouldn't get it carried away about your recovery or even finding the cure for cancer. Besides, Jesus is going to come back and make all things not new. No, a good doctor is about the, the work of restoration. Just because we know that Jesus is going to come back and make all things new doesn't mean that we don't join him in what he's doing today uh, to restore uh, people and places. We are in it for the long haul. Leadership development uh, is a journey. Restoration is a journey. We are committed to this journey of restoration and God dictates the destination. See, like Abram, we know where God is pointing. So we go not knowing where we're going to end up, but we trust the God who we follow. Uh, You know, a place that has followed God 
uh, in this journey to a T is Lawndale Community Church in Chicago. Lawndale has, has been coming alongside residents to empower and to make change for 40 years. And for this reason, we consider them a, a mentor church. If you visit Lawndale today, you'll see a dramatic, the, the dramatic results of 40 years of transformation that has happened. And you'll see it um, in the form of a health center, a fitness center, a, a recovery home, a, a legal center, a developed corporation. Uh, uh, they have restaurants and much more. Uh, every building constructed and transformational organization is a ministry of the church. And it's, this model has worked for them for 40 years. They've always seen the potential and they've always seen the assets and the leadership and the skills right there in Lawndale. And that's our approach at Wellington Heights Community Church. We are a church of and with the community, being built by the community. We are committed to indigenous leadership development. That is developing leaders from the neighborhood, empowering them to live their talents and their gifts. We wanna encourage youth to get an education, but, but to commit to come back and dwell and invest in this area or other under-resourced areas like this area. Because there's a better dream than, than the American dream. There's a dream of being part of what God is doing and transfer his transformational work in, in places uh, that have been systematically torn down. Uh, we want to develop uh, leaders um, that, that, that enter into the agony and the pain of this time. We want to revive the Martin Luther Kings. We want to revive the Mother Teresas, the Du Bois, the Harriet Tubmans, the, the Bonhoeffers, the, the Wilberforces, right? Uh, they weren't leaders because of their knowledge. They were leaders because they entered into the agony and the pain of their time. This world doesn't have time for, for leaders whose only persecution and danger is a rejection of their faith at a coffee shop. We need to rise and raise up leaders who will who will not only go into Samaria, but will live there. Leaders who will go to where the lepers are. Leaders who don't uh, who don't use their theology to make excuses of why they shouldn't be by the, the least of these. We want to develop uh, bold and courageous leaders who won't just go into the coffee house, but the crack house, who will risk their lives to fight for justice for all people and reform for the police departments and social systems and schools. Uh, leaders who won't just continue preaching their sermon series when another black body has died in the hands of prejudiced people or senseless gang violence. Leaders who will preach the saving gospel of Jesus and demonstrate it by receiving all people. A leader does all of this and is okay with not getting an ounce of recognition because we do it for the glory of God and the preservation of the dignity of the people who we're called to. That's the type of leader that we need today. And that's the type of disciple who we're trying to make. Many are leaving the church because they have found how far their leaders are willing to sacrifice. God has invested in, in people in so-called under-resourced communities and he's called the church to train and disciple people. Jesus didn't just um, wait to his crew to be ready. He had on the job training and many people are waiting for the church to give them on the job training. We must enter into the agony of our time and train others to do the same. And that's what Jesus did. He entered into the agony of his day. As a leader, Jesus took on the evil deeds and nailed them to the cross. For all those who receive the gift of forgiveness of their sins, we are we are given the right to be called the children of God. And you, if you haven't received the gift of, of forgiveness, I encourage you to pray and ask God to move into your life and vocally receive the gift of forgiveness today. And buckle up because as you enter into to, and join into God's team, uh, we, get to, we get to join God in his people in the journey of restoration and reconciliation. And I wanted to I wanted to end with this quote from John Perkins. Uh, he uses it uh, in a lot of uh, in a lot of sermons and a lot of uh, places where he speaks. And it speaks on leadership development. And it goes like this: Go to the people, live with them, learn from them, love them. Start with what they know, build with what they have, 
but with the best leaders. When the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say, we have done it ourselves. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you so much that we get to join you in your work of restoration and reconciliation. We thank you so much for your son that came down and demonstrated love, the love that we're supposed to give to our neighbors and, and the love that you give to us. God, help us to love our neighbors. Help us to see all people, no matter where they're from, as made in the image of God with dignity, worth and value and talents. God, forgive us for for looking and judging people based on their race and based on their socioeconomic status. God, get that out of us, God, and, and put in us purity, put in this holiness. God, we thank you so much that we again get to join you in restoration and in reconciliation. Uh, empower us in our families, empower us in our, in our circles, God, and, and challenge us to be more like you every day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you have a blessed Sunday and rest of the week. Thank you for joining. Oh, how about